So it's six o'clock now. We're going to go by the Swiss uh, clock and try to start uh, really on time. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you tonight and um, to present to you somebody that doesn't need actually an introduction. I think most of you might know Dave Singh. Dave is um, Professor of Clinical Pharmacology and Respiratory Medicine at the University of Manchester. He graduated in Cambridge and he is really heavily involved in the development of drugs for asthma and COPD. He has been involved in almost any trial you've heard about um, in asthma and COPD for the last years. And he's the medical director of the Medicines Evaluation Unit. So he has really a profound knowledge about um, what you have to think about into design if you are designing a trial for new drugs. And this profound expertise he will be sharing with us tonight in a webinar called Clinical Trial Designs in the Age of Precision Medicine. So what we have to think about if we're trying to evaluate new drugs, which are the study designs that would make sense to consider and what are the caveats of those? Which are, are the best designs we can choose? And we are looking forward for his talk and also for the nice discussion we're going to be having with all the participants. That's a nice thing about this webinars that we can really chat. And I'm going to be expecting to get your questions for Dave uh, in the chat function. So also during his talk, you could please uh, type in your questions and we're going to try to address as many questions as possible. Um, Dave has prepared a very nice talk that is divided in three different sections. And in between the sections, we're going to have time for questions and answers. So don't um, expect anything boring. There will be a lot of interaction tonight. And um, I don't want to take more time for, from Dave for this presentation. Dave, uh, Dave welcome. And uh, thank you very much for being with us tonight. Diana, thank you. Thank you very much for setting everything up nicely in the very kind introduction. So let's get moving straight away. We have a lot of ground to cover. So clinical trial designs. The way I want to do the lecture tonight is, first of all, start with some general concepts. And then as we move forward, I will deal more and more with the complexities that we now face in the age of precision medicine. So there, there are my conflicts of interest for you to see quickly before we start. So here's an outline. Diana already mentioned that we'll split this into three sections. There'll be time for discussion between each section. So the first part is an overview generally of randomized control trials, RCTs. I guess some of you in the audience have designed these, some of you have been investigators, some of you have analyzed data from these, maybe others in the audience have just read about them. So I, I want to give an overview. Then we come to the, uh, I think the important stuff. How do you interpret RCTs? And then also a look at smaller studies. And I've been involved in a number of these in terms of early phase drug development. An early phase dr drug development is important for the new molecules that are contributing to our current precision medicine paradigm. I should say at the start that most of my slides are around asthma and CUPD because that's where my experience lies. So I apologize to those of you who are interested in other lung diseases. I hope you can take these principles into those other areas. Then we'll go into precision medicine. And then at the end, short section, we'll look at real world studies. So let's get going. Randomized control trials. Now, many people view these as the gold standard and you'll see why shortly that they're able to change guidelines. They're used by drug regulatory authorities for licensing. And the benefits of, of RCTs we'll deal with first. RCTs, you're able to control many aspects of the trial. That's why they're controlled trials. You often have strict inclusion and exclusion criteria, and I've put a set of common 
inclusion criteria for asthma studies here, just to give an example. Asthma trials often have non-smokers. Patients with significant other illnesses can't get in. The patients have to demonstrate good inhaler technique, high adherence to, th to therapy, reversibility at screening. Now, actually what this does is it narrows down the patient population and homogenizes the patient population. We'll come back later on when we talk about real world studies about the pros and cons of this narrowing down of the population. One of the pros is that by having a homogenous population, you reduce bias, you know that active versus control, the patient populations are likely to be very, very similar. You can also then start to measure small treatment effects. And small treatment effects obviously depend on the measurement, your primary and secondary outcomes, but by measuring these in a clinical trial setting in where the patient comes to see you rather than relying on real world data, you can use measurements with more precision. So this is why these types of designs are widely used. And the, re the reason why guidelines love these types of studies is the low risk of bias. So I picked out me living in England, I've picked out the British Thoracic Society guidelines to show you different levels of evidence that are typical in guidelines. And here we have the highest level of evidence would come from various sources and then highlighted in yellow, RCTs with a low risk of bias. The highest, the highest two forms of evidence include a single RCT with very low or low risk of bias. Let me give you an example. How a pivotal study can change a guideline. I'm going back here to the 1990s for something now that's very integral and core to asthma management, and it's the use of ics larva combinations. Here's a very simple RCT of ics larva in inhaled corticosteroid plus long-acting beta agonist compared to corticosteroid alone. I'm sure you all have seen these studies. Combination treatment is better than inhaled corticosteroid alone. And these well-controlled RCTs very quickly changed asthma guidelines. So that's the power of these studies. Drug regulators also want to see these studies. If you, want, if you have a new drug, you want to bring it to market, the regulators tell you, you have to perform a randomized controlled trial, depending on the disease in the later phases, phase three, they may say to you, I want to see two very similar studies. And I'll come back to this study later on, monoclonal antibody, dupilumab, which targets our interleukin-4 and interleukin-13 signaling in severe asthma. Here's the pivotal phase three study in severe asthma patients. So a randomized controlled trial, narrowing in again on the patient population, severe asthma and looking at the effects of treatment at different dosing regimes. So there's a monthly regime, a fortnightly regime against placebo. The y-axis is exacerbations. And on the basis of this type of data, you can select the correct regime for clinical practice. So that's a sort of overview of randomized control trials. So to liven things up, I've got a few polling questions throughout the course of this, uh, this evening's seminar. So I want you to just give me your opinion. And these polling questions have no right and no wrong answer. I just want to know what you think. So large RCTs provide results that translate into clinical practice. What's your opinion? Is that true most of the time? About half the time? less than half the time. So over to you, please give us your view.
So I think there's maybe a few hundred people online. So I'm expecting lots of uh, feedback on this question. So we'll just give it <clears throat> a few seconds to go through then hopefully we should see the results of the poll on the screen in a second. So here we have it. Yeah, I hope you can all see it. So many of you think that large RCTs do translate into clinical practice uh, at least half the time or most of the time. You've got 80% of you think that they are of value to your clinical practice. And I think that's, that's very reasonable. Again, there was no right or wrong answer to that. But the fact most of you think they have some meaning must, must implicate the fact that these well-designed studies that reduce bias provide you with a de degree of confidence in what they said, in what the results are. So I said that I would give you a view about smaller clinical trials and drug development as well. So I do a lot of this stuff. Probably most people read studies that are the larger phase three studies. So these are the really big ones that companies do for licensing a product. But before you get to phase three, you need to do a series of smaller experiments. So phase one is where you first administer drugs to human beings. Often these studies are done in healthy subjects just to get safety and pharmacokinetic data. Then you move into phase two. Now, occasionally phase one studies are done in patients, but phase two is definitely when you get to patients. For reasons of safety, you have restricted numbers, but you, you start to see to generate data on clinical effects, and you have to try and narrow down the dose selection. So in these early phase two studies, you have to use different designs. You can't have hundreds of patients. Uh, and so you need to be inventive. And in asthma and CUPD, we often look at challenge studies but, or biomarker studies. And these can help us evaluate dose response relationships. Let me give you some examples. So for asthma, drugs being developed to target allergic or T2 inflammation, we often do allergen challenge studies as the first exposure to patients. And here's one where a CRTH2 antagonist inhibited the late phase response. The important point is we could show this with just 20 patients. And then here's a more recent study that we did in COPD, and this is an inhaled PD-4 inhibitor, a novel, a novel way of delivering this type of drug. These are sputum samples, and we saw inhibition of a number of inflammatory mediators. Now, the last two studies you've seen, they don't tell you that the drug will work in real life but they do give you a strong clue that there's biological, pharmacological activity in just small numbers of patients, and that gives you confidence to go forward. And this study you see here was just done in about 50 patients. Now you have to try and select the dose, and that's where you get into some inventive study designs. Adaptive study designs are common, and here you see a study done about seven or eight years ago of an of a P38, an anti-inflammatory compound. This is the phase one, two program. Now this was done in COPD patients. You can see different doses. And what I wanna draw your attention to is the top of the table where you see different numbers of patients. So the lowest dose, 18 patients, at the six milligram dose, 65 patients. And this is because you do interim analyses, adaptive design as you go along. And where you see utility, a drug, a dose you don't think will work, you stop recruitment and you start loading up the other arms. So that's one important aspect of these RCTs. And another one is the p-value. Now this is an important point because in, thing, in medicine we stick very rigorously to p0.05. 
And, and I don't want this to turn into a statistics debate, but there are other ways of looking at data. And what you see here is Bayesian analysis. And with this, you can actually have a different way of viewing the results. The bottom two rows, the probability of effect. Now the probability of effect on lung function greater than 75 mils for the six milligram dose was 67%. And that eventually was the dose that went forward. And these studies cannot, with restricted numbers, cannot be powered for 5% p-values. So with that in mind, let's go to another polling question. And you don't have to be influenced by what I've just told you. I just want to get your view. Small randomized control trials, they can provide valuable information. So what's your view? Often, sometimes, rarely, or you can just tell me you never look at them. So let's get the uh, let's get the view of the audience back. Hopefully the uh, the percentages will come online soon. So interesting. I think many of you see some value at least in small RCTs. That that makes me happy because it means I'm not wasting my time doing them. But but you can see how they're important to drug development, and but they do nearly always need validation with a bigger study. So thank you all for for voting, and let's keep moving. Right. So the last part of this section before we open up for discussion about interpretation of RCTs. And I'm gonna focus on large RCTs now. And this part will then lead into the concepts around precision medicine. So the first point is that we all know this, there is in between individual variation in responses to drug therapy. So here's a typical graph. You see this with all drugs. You see it in your clinical practice. Some people don't respond. Some people have a, a small response. Then a, some people have a big response. So, and the number of individuals with each of these varies. So let me bring this to light. Here's a study of inhaled corticosteroids on FEV1 response. You see a lot of patients having a response that's positive, some having no response and some having an enormously good response. That's what you see in asthma, that's what you see in trials. So we have to take that on board. Now I've picked out here a few of the bigger, large COPD studies done in recent years that have caused controversy. And in my view, many of the differences between these treatments are simply due to the fact that the patient populations are different. And as soon as you change the patient population, your drug response might change. So here's the FLAME study. It's a comparison of dual bronchodilator, so two bronchodilators against inhaled corticosteroid and long-acting beta agonist. There's a run-in period, about a month, on long-acting bronchodilator only. So that's the FLAME study. Then we have the IMPACT study. There's actually no running period on another medication, you just take your own medicine, then you're immediately randomized. Now that has an effect because you don't harmonize the population. But the key point is that the patient population was completely different. The FLAME study, most patients had one exacerbation in the last year. In the IMPACT study, Three quarters of the patients had two exacerbations or hospitalizations in the last year. So put simply, there's a different way of randomization and this population, the impact population are much, much sicker. So when you look at the data for exacerbations in the FLAME study, the dual bronchodilator was better than ics LABA, And in the impact study, in terms of exacerbation rate, the worst treatment was dual bronchodilator. Now this actually caused a lot of debate when these two studies came out. People thought there was something wrong with one of the studies. In my view, there was nothing wrong with either study, well-designed, well-conducted, 
different patient populations. So when I read randomized control trials, often the reasons for differences are different populations, different running periods, and different inhaled molecules. So people, when they saw the flame study, started making inferences about triple therapy, but actually triple therapy wasn't in the flame study. Finally, let me give you another example of triple therapy and inhaled corticosteroid. What you saw in, 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 in the flame and impact studies was with a sicker population, inhaled corticosteroids had a bigger effect. Now, there was a series of studies done with this triple therapy, beclomethazone, formotrol, glycopronium, and they all had the same population. They were all one year long studies, and this population had one exacerbation mostly in the last year. And then the comparison here, it was against ICS LABA. And in other studies, there were different comparators, and you'll see them all in a second. But here's the important point they all use the same inclusion criteria. And the inclusion criteria, patients could not be on triple therapy. And that means there was no step down of therapy. And when you get step down, some, the exacerbation rate often goes up. So have a look at this. In these three studies with the same inclusion criteria, you get very consistent data. Triple therapy was better than all the comparators, but the y-axis, the exacerbation rate is completely different to studies where people with triple therapy were allowed in, because when you come in, if you were in the control arm, the exacerbation rate would go up. The, all these studies, again, I stress, there's nothing wrong with them. They all give different data because they all had different designs and different populations. So last polling question for this section. I'm going to ask you about the next slide. I've shown you about individual data. What's your view on pooled analysis? Pooled analysis of RCTs are the gold standard. People love looking at this. What do you think? Agree, disagree, unsure? So a fair spread. A fair spread. So 38% uh, of you agree that pooled analyses are the gold standard, which is interesting. So given the fact that my lecture is about the age of precision medicine, one of the reasons I showed you the last few slides was to highlight how data can change with different populations. And I focused on triple therapy. Now, when you pool different studies, you start to lose that precision of understanding what happens in a patient population. So we have the impact study at the top in a very high exacerbation risk population. Then we have the tribute study where the exacerbation risk was lower. So the ICS benefit is smaller. And then we have a couple of studies, Sunset and Wisdom, where actually the patients had no exacerbations and the design is completely different. These are inhaled corticosteroid withdrawal studies. And you see that the effect size of triple therapy versus dual bronchodilator varies between all these studies. Why? Because they're all in different populations and some of them study adding on ICS and some of them study taking away ICS. If you want precision medicine, don't lump all this together. If you want Lumping medicine, that's what a pooled analysis will give you in the age of precision medicine, in my view, pooled analysis don't help you that much. Handing over back to Diana for discussion. Great, thank you very much for this first exciting part, Dave. Um, and we are getting some questions from the participants. Again, please, uh, if you have any question you'd like to post to Dave, send us in the chat and we'll try to address this. Um, we 
have we are a bit over time, Dave, so we're going to try to keep this now short. But there is one question. Um, you, you touched upon uh, the probability statistics, um, Bayesian analysis. And there is one interesting question um, asking about whether this kind of analysis are currently accepted by regulatory agencies. Perhaps you could give us a short description of the Bayesian analysis. What is this and why it is deferred to the um, let's say, um, conventional statistical way of the evidence medicine to describe things with the p-value? What is the difference there? And um, if you could share with us the idea whether this is currently accepted for regulatory studies by the regulatory bodies. Yeah, sure. So uh, I can only talk about my experience and people on online may, may have uh, different experiences, but the regulatory authorities will accept these type of analyses in earlier phase studies because they allow you in smaller numbers then to, for example, say, well, I'm 90% sure or I'm 80% sure that this drug has an effect bigger than 50%, but it doesn't give you that 95% that you need for a phase three study. So the regulators will let you use it in an early phase study to pick a dose, but they'll want you to do a confirmatory study with a P of 0 0.05. And the, the beauty of it is, is it restricts your numbers in early studies because you're not trying to get that 0 0.05. So you, have, you, you, you can have smaller numbers. Okay, so um, that we have a few questions. I'll just pick on another one and keep the one, uh, the other ones for the next discussion uh, break. We're going to have. There is one specific question about um, the asthma and COPD studies you were discussing. I think as pneumologists, we always try to find out well what is the right approach, and um, in your opinion, um, what is what do you think about how asthma has been used as an inclusion criteria in this um, asthma COPD studies or the COPD studies you were discussing? Is this, um, was this a fair exclusion criteria used? You think this is comparable for giving uh, an information about the COPD population we treat in the uh, routine? So, so I, I'm going to come on, can we park that a second? Because I'm going to come sure. on to eosinophils later. I'll, I'll, I'll make a quick comment though. I, th I think what the, the question is about is that some of the large triple therapy studies, if you had a past diagnosis of asthma, but your current predominant diagnosis was COPD and you had the, the smoking history and your clinician said you had COPD, then you were allowed in. Uh, it, it would have been useful to have collected uh, how many of those people had a past diagnosis of asthma. I think that would have been very useful in that for analysis. But I think it doesn't negate the value of any of these trials because clearly all the patients were being treated in real life as having COPD. So in terms of precision medicine, it would have been better to have that extra information that would have been helpful. Great. Okay, uh, so I'll... There are questions I would like to address afterwards, but I, I would suggest we move uh, the, to the next chapter, precision medicine. There are questions around precision medicine here, and we are looking forward for the next uh, chapter of this story. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, thanks. So, so I started to bring in the concept in the last section that different populations have different responses to therapy. And I made the comment that for COPD, if you have more exacerbations, what we saw in the studies was that you're more likely to get a benefit from corticosteroids. And precision medicine is using as much information on individual characteristics as you can to try and decide to make good treatment decisions in real life. And this information can be clinical, genetic, or biological. So let me give you, let me have some definitions first. So phenotype is what you see, it's what you observe. So that's clinical phenotype. Endotype is a subtype of the condition defined by a mechanism. So there's a big difference between these two. So let me give you an example of an endotype, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. That's a mechanism and we use a biomarker, a blood test, to, set, to say somebody has alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. That's an endotype. 
there's a relationship between endotypes and phenotypes. So patients can have multiple mechanisms. Lung diseases, it's often that patients have multiple mechanisms. So they therefore have multiple endotypes. And you need biomarkers to detect these biological mechanisms. These endotypes give rise to clinical phenotypes. It's what the patient says, it's what you can see as a clinician. So precision medicine will integrate the clinical phenotype information you have and the endotype information you can get to try and define populations with the greatest chance of benefit. So using all this information, can we define populations who will have a green effect? Can we use precision medicine to say, right, we have the best chance of, with drug A, having patients who have a positive effect and no toxicity? And we try and avoid as much as possible the red zone. No benefit, but toxicity. So I'm going to deal with some CUPD examples, then some asthma examples. So let me give you an example. Roflumilast, a PD4 inhibitor. I'm going back 10 years here. The initial Roflumilast studies that were done in phase three were negative. Then a sub-analysis on the presence of chronic bronchitis versus no chronic bronchitis. And that's what I've highlighted in the box here. And it stood out a long way. The, the clinical characteristic of chronic bronchitis defined a responder population. So this is part of precision medicine, clinical phenotype. So what about biomarkers? So we wrote this review article and I've just put the contents here because they highlight the different uses of biomarkers. Biomarkers can be diagnostic, they can be prognostic, they can predict pharmacological effect, they can be exacerbation biomarkers, they can be a biomarker of disease activity. One of the important points for precision medicine is a biomarker can have a single use. Now, this is really important. People sometimes say, well, this biomarker X is not useful because, well, it has this function and it's validated for this function. For example, it's prognostic, but it doesn't distinguish between disease and control and it's not a pharmacological biomarker, etc. But it's fine in medicine to have a biomarker that has a single use. And for example, you, we all use cancer diagnostic biomarkers all the time. They have a single use and we're quite happy. So in precision medicine, we should bear that in mind. So here's two examples of biomarkers that have in CUPD that have single uses. So the one at the bottom is an FDA approved biomarker it's approved for use in clinical trials. It has no other use. It's not useful in clinical practice on an individual basis. It's useful in clinical trials on a group basis. And the reason is it enriches the population for people who are going to exacerbate and for a mortality signal. So if you're designing a study, you, you could use a fibrinogen cutoff and above this, you've enriched for more chances of those events. The fact it has a single use doesn't negate the fact that it's actually extremely useful for this purpose. Now, the other one I'm gonna come on to is, is bloody eosinophils. They just have one use. They're useful for predicting who might respond to inhaled corticosteroid. They're not prognostic, they're not diagnostic, and yet, People criticize this biomarker in the age of precision medicine because it fails on other criteria. And I think it's fine to recognize it fails on other criteria. But if we want to advance in precision medicine, we have to take on board that biomarkers are useful, even if they only have one single use. And here's the use that they have. Now, a number of clinical trials in CUPD have nearly all come up with the same thing retrospective analysis, prospective analyses, 
they show that at a level of around 100 eosinophils, below this, inhaled corticosteroids have little effect, and above this, corticosteroids have a bigger and bigger effect on exacerbation prevention. Now, I stress again, you combine clinical and biomarker information. So this biomarker only works in patients who have a history of exacerbations. So it's a very narrow use of a biomarker, only in a certain type of population and only for, pre pre for predicting ICS effects. And the magic number is 100. Below this, there doesn't appear to be much ICS effect. Above this, the benefit gets bigger and bigger. We go back to the impact study, a bit more complicated, but it shows really the same thing. The green line is dual bronchodilator. The lines at the bottom are ICS combinations. And around 100, the treatments diverge. But what's interesting is when you split the impact population out according to their previous exacerbation risk, precision medicine. So at the top, are the patients with the lowest rate of exacerbations, and the bottom two panels are those with, those with the biggest rate of previous exacerbations. And it's fairly obvious, the benefit of ICS is dependent on clinical information. The bottom two patient groups have a bigger benefit of ICS. And it's also dependent on biomarker information. So the age of precision medicine in trials, in clinical practice, requires you to integrate biological and clinical information. And that's what gold does now. I don't want to talk about this for very long, only to highlight that the complexity in gold is all about exacerbation risk and the use of biomarkers. Now, what you essentially do in developing these biomarkers is you have retrospective analyses, and that's how blood eosinophils were developed and implemented. Then you need prospective analyses, and you also need to work the mechanism out. So Diana asked me earlier so the question about, well, is this asthma? And there's lots and lots of emerging information now that actually there's T2 inflammation in CUPD patients, even when you exclude patients who historically had a diagnosis of asthma or who have allergies. And here's a study that uh, we conducted in our lab. There's a replicate cohort that I don't have time to show you tonight, but there's a, an initial cohort and a replica. We took six common genes that are recognized in asthma biomarker studies, and we looked at them in patients with higher numbers of eosinophils, above 250. And we saw that four of them lit up. Here's three of them. Click A1, eotactin 2 and IL-13, not all six. And this tells you that eosinophilic CUPD has a T2 signature, but it's different to asthma. So actually to simply call it, well, this is just asthma, is not very precise, the age of precision medicine. And there's something else going on at the other end of the eosinophil spectrum, and it looks like the patients with less eosinophils are actually the bacterially colonized ones. That's what's in this analysis from the Barcelona group. Less than 100 eosinophils, more chronic bacterial infection, more pneumonia events. So this is the paradigm where, where CUPD is splitting into for more precise treatment, higher eosinophils. And there aren't strict thresholds for this because it integrates with clinical information, higher eosinophils, more T2 inflammation, less eosinophils, more bacterial inflammation, and a lower response to ICS. So let's come to the same type of thinking in asthma. Remember I said earlier, the way we've been working this out is you take data sets and then you look retrospectively and then you need to do prospective studies. So here's a retrospective analysis of anti-R5 benvolizumab data in severe asthma. And there's increasing recognition of the late onset eosinophilic asthma subtype. These are not allergic patients. They have nasal polyps. They have gas trapping. They have essentially an adult onset. So I said late onset. That's not true. Adult onset asthma. 
And these patients with less allergies, but more eosinophil driven disease seem to have a bigger response to anti-AL5 therapies. So it's T2 inflammation, but it's a subtype of T2 inflammation. I said I'd come back to this anti-AL4 and anti-AL13 targeted therapy. So you would think, well, wow, this is fairly targeted and it works in severe asthma. But let's look at the same thing. Let's look at the data in detail. Actually, it works more in people with more eosinophils and higher nitric oxide levels. So it works even better in patients who have more T2 inflammation. And I don't think we've come to the end of this story because for biologics and asthma, we have new ones that are in development. We've still yet to differentiate between the existing ones. And that's part of the challenge for precision medicine. Now, lastly, I just want to highlight, I focus very much in the last few slides on exacerbations. And because of time, I don't really have enough scope to go into the various endpoints that we should think about. But there have been efforts to, to develop and validate new endpoints. And here's one of those that we've seen in the last five or more years, the CAT, uh, the, the COPD assessment test. And this is now widely used in clinical practice, except, uh, and this is the regulatory submission that was put to the FDA for this to be used as an endpoint. So there is mileage in this, developing new endpoints, but it's a long road using it in your practice and getting the regulators to agree. And for the moment, each disease knows that for the final approval of your medicine, the regulators are still looking at the traditional endpoints that they've always looked at. So opened up for discussion. Great. So um, now we've got more information about how we're going to develop from here. What is the precision medicine we are looking for and um, how we should proceed? And with that, I have some questions, Dave, coming from the, our participants. The one data, uh, the one question um, came from two, three persons trying to find out your opinion about pulling subgroups. Um, information from different studies. I mean, we have all these large studies that had subgroup analysis. When you put them together, do you think this is a valid way to increase the amount of information we have accessible and try to move the field forward, or there are dangers uh, involved to, to this approach? So, D Diana, in, in general, I think pooling is very useful when you have small groups and you're unsure of the effect. So, if you have small, if you have five small studies and they weren't well powered, and they and they have fairly similar populations, I think it's quite useful to put them together. I think when you already know the answer, as I tried to highlight earlier, when you pull studies, sometimes you lose the answer because some some of the patient populations were very different. I think perhaps the question is uh, also could be applied to when you have large studies and you have subgroups in them and you want to put those subgroups together, I think that that's fine for an exploratory analysis. You need to be inventive. You will end up having to do a confirmatory study. Okay. So it will depend, right? It will depend on what we're looking at to, to, um, to answer this question. Yeah. Then the, I think there was an interesting question around um, what are the further steps you see coming up? Now we have, for example, in asthma medication that works pretty well. Um, it's still a bit undefined which medication for which patient. We know they all work into too high inflammation in asthma, but are there peculiarities of a patient group? Is there, are there biomarkers that would be associated with more response? And the question is, how would you see the further development now in trials? Should you do trials looking at the predictors of response or should you rather do trials uh, selecting patients by certain biomarkers and then including patients in the trial and looking at uh, the effect? How would you go, how you would move from here? Yeah, very interesting um, area and, and what, one with many challenges. But what, what I was trying to highlight was that the, the, the biomarker information doesn't necessarily tell you about mechanism. 
So we saw the eosinophil inflammatory um, relationship in COPD. I was just, I'm just calling that one out and I'll come back to asthma. But we didn't understand why, and we still don't understand fully why. But the data emerging then is that the low eosinophil population is different, it's bacterially colonized, and the higher eosinophil population isn't just the eosinophils, we're starting to get a profile of T2 inflammation, and that would make sense why they respond to inhaled corticosteroids. So I think you have to do mechanistic work to build on your understanding. So to apply that to asthma, the, the two approaches you said, I think they're both valuable, we definitely need to do mechanistic work to understand. So for example, a monoclonal antibody, exactly what mechanisms is it working on in asthma patients? So, so more biological sampling, more development of novel endpoints, longer term studies, microbiome studies, et cetera. A proper understanding and, and relating that then to biomarkers that those patients have. And then you go back in and do a, pro a prospective biomarker driven subgroup analysis to prove that hypothesis. So I think it's all about understanding, once you've got this initial biomarker signals, it's all about understanding mechanisms to build precision medicine. And probably also focusing on the pathophysiological process, as you see, when once you see a drug works out in the clinic to go back and try to take a look at how it works and how we could move from there. And um, it may, sorry, and it may not just be, I was saying, you know, biological sampling and what you said, it may be CT scanning, other measurements as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so coming back to that, um, we have a lot of data on eosinophils that um, originate from post hoc analysis, from uh, observational studies, from intervention studies, but that were not, in which patients were not randomized to um, receive treatment or not based on the eosinophils. Do we need the studies or, uh, I mean, we've been surprised with several um, negative results once the randomized study has been done um, based on observational data. Do you think we would need such kind of studies with interventions on the eosinophils or is this something that based on the overwhelming evidence we have nowadays, it's not necessary to be done anymore? I think from a, a real world clinical practice point of view, it, it, it is very useful to have studies that then validate that this works in, in real life clinical practice. So I think that's, uh, that, that comes into my next session on real world evidence. So uh, having all this information is, is useful. I think the, the randomized controlled trials in that tight design prove the concept. And I think what you're getting at then is, does it work in the real world? And then it's, it's worth looking at, does it work in the real world? Yes. Okay. Uh, we also had a question about endpoints. And I think if you are looking at this, how do you, when you're developing a study, you think about many things, you don't ha want to have a negative trial, so you'd rather take an endpoint that you might be able to influence with your therapy duration of the doses you're looking at. How do you do it yourself? How do you, how do you find out which is the best endpoint? And would you go for one endpoint or there is a value of saying the primary is the co-primary would be that. Can you mix things for the endpoint? How do you deal with this? Yeah, great question. It, it, it very much depends on whether you're doing a drug development study or a study in, uh, of, for example, I'll, I'll just refer to drug studies uh, with a drug that's already uh, approved and you want to do it to try and understand um, a, a test a hypothesis. So if you're doing a, uh, a, an initial test of a hypothesis, I think it's more reasonable to have a smaller study with co-primary endpoints because you know later on you're going to have to do a larger study. Uh, and I, I think in, in those types of studies, it's more reasonable to be more exploratory. And you can even use the sort of Bayesian approaches where you're not, you're not giving the absolute confirmatory answer, you're generating something, some information that somebody else in a bigger study, even you will validate. So it all depends whether you want the definitive answer or uh, something that helps you get to the, the definitive answer. Very good. And um, so not all studies are confirmatory, even the randomized controlled trials give us some information that has 
to be confirmed in the real world. Sometimes the results differ a lot when uh, these results are used in the practice. And that's what we're going to be discussing in the next chunk uh, of the talk. So we are looking forward to hear about the real world studies. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for sending your, your questions in. Uh, so now, randomized controlled trials versus real world trials. So. We, we, we've looked at RCTs a lot, and they, what they do is they have a high degree of internal validity. So the reduction of bias, removal of many confounding factors, the fact that patients come in to trial centers and the measurements are done there, and the measurements might have low variability, and this gives you a really good chance of having a sensitive study design to see the effect of treatment. So there, there are all the positive points. So one of the things that happens in real life and in randomized control trials is adherence goes down over time. We, we see this all the time. And th this, this issue, even if you keep adherence up in an RCT, is something that you don't really know how it will play out in clinical practice. And for example, it would be fantastic to have a drug that's 100% efficient, but absolutely no good if you had to take it five times a day. Adherence would be poor. So the value of real world studies is, in my view, they provide an enormous amount of complementary information after you've got some initial evidence from RCTs. You can incorporate real world adherence. And I mentioned earlier, narrow populations, real world studies give you the wide population and easy access to, to many subgroups. So some of the limitations though of real world studies is the diagnosis. Often you're relying on primary care records. You may have patients included with the wrong diagnosis. I've talked about the sensitivity, sensitivity of measurements. You often lose that type of sensitivity. So I'm gonna get your view now, uh, another poll. So real world data, is it too imprecise, not very, very valuable, or does it give you valuable data and we, we need much more of it? So very straightforward, are you a fan, are you not a fan? Hopefully we should get that result through very soon. And then I'm gonna give you, so lots of you love real world data and I'm pleased about that because so do I, as long as you recognize it's the, what exactly that data is telling you and its limitations. So let me give you two examples from Salford and Salford's in Manchester. And these are two of the largest real world studies that have been done in recent times. One in asthma, one in CUPD. And what happened was that in primary care, patients were randomized to here we have ICS LABA, or they just carried on with what they would normally do. And it was very what you might call light touch. Here's the asthma part, telephone assessments at three, six, and nine months. And they only came to the study center at the start and at the end. What you want to do is leave the patients alone as far as possible and see what happens. Now, the novelty here, the hypothesis being tested was that the once a day in how corticosteroid combination would be better than usual care, which incorporated twice a day treatments. And that's what they found, that actually asthma control in this real world setting where once a day my patients might be more adherent was much better than everyday practice. So what about the CUPD study? Very similar design. And here the patients were required simply to have a CUPD exacerbation in the last three years, just one. Now I showed you some CUPD exacerbation studies earlier. And generally, the, when you ask patients, when you have an inclusion criteria of one exacerbation in the last year, you end up with most of the patients having one or two. Now, a real world population 
the number of exacerbations in the 12 months before randomization on average was two, much higher than, than those types of patients in randomized control trials. These patients are sicker. So RCTs actually do not enroll the sickest COPD patients. So really all I'm highlighting here in the age of precision medicine is that we are going to have different types of clinical trial information and RCT and real world evidence is part of the puzzle. So last poll, over to you. What do you want to see in future? So this puts you on the spot. Do you want to see more real world studies or do you want to see more RCTs focused on precision medicine? And I, that's really unfair of me because I've just told you that I think we need both. So you're gonna to have to express, express your preference here. So hopefully we should get the answer now. Yeah, and I think that's fair, a fairly even split. It's not a fair question, but it shows you that, that there's a value to both of these. So that should bring us to the close and a little bit more time for discussion. Excellent, excellent, uh, Dave, thank you. Um, so real world studies, I think um, it is a very important piece that sometimes we try to neglect a little bit as not being that relevant. Uh, the quality of data tend not to be the, 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 the one we are used to see in our cities. On the other side, it does express more um, uh, information that you might also see or the, the response you might see on your patients. We have one question coming in and if you could please comment on responder analysis. What is that and what, how does it help us? Yeah, so, so responder analysis is usually when you set a predefined level and you think that's a clinically relevant level. Uh, and it could be in a lung function or a patient reported outcome symptoms. So you say on this questionnaire, if the patient goes above a, so for St. George's, the health related quality of life in CUPD is a four unit change. That's what some people use. So above this, the patient had a response. So then instead of looking at mean changes across the whole population, where on average it was a 1.5 unit change, which is not an individual statistic, a responder analysis will tell you, well, 55% of patients felt better with active compared to 23% with placebo. And so they're actually very valuable for this individualization. And someone else would like to know, uh, how, how, what do you think about observation of studies designs? Is this something that add as well, as much as the real world um, trials? So, so uh, in many ways, observational studies fit under real world studies. So there's different types of real world, real world studies. They could be observational, they could be pragmatic randomized controlled trials. They can, be, they can be open, they can actually be blinded in, in, in some ways. So um, they all have value as long as you, you integrate the information with all the other information and try and make your deduction. What I was really trying to, to get at in that last section is that, you know, when I put the puzzle up, try and fit all the pieces of the puzzle together. And I think, and I believe we all think, Dave, you did a fantastic job tonight. Uh, you brought, brought us this kind of dry topic of studies design is a, in a very fashionable and interesting way. We've learned not only about study design, but also about COPD and asthma. And I think all of us understood uh, how important it is to combine information from mechanistic studies, more studies looking at pathophysiology, perhaps with more invasive procedures such as bronchoscopy, to randomized control trials, but also to real life studies to tell us what's going to happen if we are implementing this therapy or this procedure in our everyday practice. So I thank you very much, Dave, for this fantastic talk tonight. I think I thank all our participants for uh, the active contributions, fantastic questions. Um, it was a great session. And I also thank the ERS, the European Respiratory Society, for, give, for giving us the opportunity to meet tonight and all for, for the all assistance we got to get this webinar running. Thank you very much to all of you. Have a good night and keep safe. Thank you.